E Evaluation Resource Center at Western Michigan University. I'm Kristen Martens, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. With me here at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan is Lori Wingate, the Director of Evaluate. Also joining us today is Rachel Bauer of ATE Central, located at the University of Wisconsin, and Elaine Kraft of Mentor Connect and the South Carolina Advanced Technological Education Center of Excellence. Behind the scenes, making sure this webinar runs smoothly, are our colleagues at Maytech Networks. It is important to note that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation. To help you keep track of who is speaking at different times during the presentation, the presenter's picture and name can be seen in the upper right corner of most of the slides. This webinar has been developed with new PIs in mind, but for those of you who aren't affiliated with the ATE program, ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education. It's an NSF program focused on improved technician education in fields like biotechnology, advanced manufacturing, nanotechnology, renewable energy, and others. Most of the funding goes to community colleges, but some work is being done at other educational levels, including K-12 and four-year colleges. So when you hear or read ATE during the webinar, that's what we're referring to. To orient you to the structure of today's webinar, you can see that we're in the midst of introductions and housekeeping because it's highlighted in blue. The webinar then has three main sections. Rachel will lead the first section, which outlines resources available to you through ATE Central. Lori will be leading the second section on evaluation purposes and uses in ATE and Elaine will lead the third section on communicating evaluation needs and expectations. So following each section, we will stop for question breaks. We will conclude with closing remarks, resources, reminders about coming events, and really importantly, a chance for you to give us your feedback through an online survey that will be available immediately following the presentation. So let's finish up with the housekeeping with a brief orientation to our webinar system. This webinar is presented through Blackboard, and it's clear by the show of hands that are being raised that many of you may already be familiar with Blackboard functions. But for those of you who are new to our webinar system, this is a screenshot of what you should see on the far left of your screen. So notice the hand icon. To raise your hand, just click on the hand icon. Just below the hand icon is the participants box. This box lists everyone who's attending this webinar today. At the bottom left is the chat box. And this is where you can type questions and comments that you would like the presenters to address. You can do this at any time as I'll be keeping track of these submissions so that, you can, or so that we can address them at the scheduled question and answer breaks that follow each section of the webinar. To ensure that everyone can follow the chat conversation, which again we really encourage everyone to participate in, be sure that the room tab is selected. This tab is located below the chat box to the far left. So let's practice using the chat box, the room chat box now. So in the room chat box, please type the name of the organization you are from and how many people are viewing this webinar in the room with you today. Go ahead and type that chat in. Great, it looks like you've got that. And if we have any polls today, which we do, be sure you don't type the letter answer into the chat box. What you want to do instead is navigate to the lowercase a icon, which is located to the right of the hand icon, and select the letter that coincides with your answer. So don't type in the chat box. Let's practice a poll now. To answer, find the lowercase a icon right next to the hand and select the letter that you want for your answer. Okay, Mike, can we see the poll answer? Okay, the results are in and there we see um, how you polled. Now for those of you that may have selected none of the above, which is actually the biggest group, can you please now use the chat box to let us know what brought you to our webinar today? 
go ahead if you selected D, type in why you're at our webinar today. Are people being shy? Well, now that you know how to interact, there we go. You know how to interact with us using the Blackboard functions. Um, we're we're going to continue on. You can go ahead and continue to type in the chat box if you wish. But we have created a handout with key points and resource links, which you may want to check out after the webinar. It's on our website now, as well as a PDF of the webinar slides. This webinar is being recorded and we'll email you the link of the recording when it's available, which commonly takes one to two days. When you, are, when you do view a recording of this webinar, you will not see the chat box conversations, just to let you know that. By the end of this webinar, it is our intent that you will know where and who to go to for help as you launch your ATE project. You will understand the role of evaluation in your ATE grant and what to do with evaluation results. And you will know the key issues to discuss with partners and evaluators to establish clear expectations and cooperative working relationships. So remember, you can type your comments or questions in the chat box at any time, and we'll go over those at the question break. Now I'll turn things over to Rachel from ATE Central. Hi, everybody. Um, as was noted, I'm Rachel Bauer. I'm the PI and Director of AT Central. And first of all, for those of you who just received funding, congratulations on your new award. It's always an exciting and sometimes a slightly overwhelming process to realize that you've gotten the money and now you have to figure out how to fulfill all those wonderful promises you made when you wrote the grant. You're going to be hearing from Lori and Elaine in just a little bit, and they're going to be providing you with an array of really useful information about evaluation and also about how to work with your own campus and project partners to collect data and project impacts as your project or center unfolds and moves forward into its first year. Um, before that, I'm going to be starting us off today by talking to you about some of the services you can expect to get from ATE Central. And some of these um, services will be very helpful to you and your evaluator as you move forward in, in looking at um, creating your evaluation plan, fleshing it out, and collecting all the data that you need um, to do as part of that process. Um, like Evaluate, while we're not a center, AT Central is a sort of cross-cutting project that serves the whole AT community in a number of ways. So what is AT Central? Well, we act as a sort of information hub for the AT community, and we support and promote the work of the AT program through a whole series of services, publications, and tools designed for AT grantees and the audiences they reach. And, and many of the things that we've designed have actually been done in conjunction with the AT community. In other words, some of the things that we've created over the years are things that the AT community specifically asked us to create. At the center of a lot of our work is the information portal itself. So we actually collect, organize, and disseminate information about the projects and centers themselves, the resources that the projects and centers use and create, and events that are sponsored or hosted or attended by uh, folks in the AT community. So while you are, for some of you anyway, um, are, are brand new to the ATE community, if you've already received notification of funding, and you probably have since you're on the webinar, you're, uh, we've, uh, we've probably already created a record for you in the information portal about your project or center. Because the minute um, those new funding awards get made, we learn about them through NSF, and we create an initial project or center record in the ATE information portal. As your project unfolds and you begin to create your deliverables, maybe some curriculum or professional development materials, we'll also point folks to those materials and, and create a catalog record about those materials on our site. So how can we help you as you begin to begin the process of working on your new award? Well, we have a handbook that could be very useful to you, and I'm going to go through each of, these, um, each of these resources individually now. We have a handbook. We have, um, as I talked about, the resource collection, an outreach kit, 
a number of publications like our newsletter, and events calendar, some reports that you'll be getting. And also I'm going to talk to you about something that is a little hard to think about right at the beginning of your grant, which is sustainability and archiving. But it's important to think about it nonetheless. All right, so the AT Central Handbook. This is available on the AT Central site. You can download it. It's a PDF. You can obviously look at it online. Sometimes I like looking at this online because it's a little easier to search that way. But you can certainly download it and print it out if you'd like. It comes out um, with new versions once or twice a year. We usually update it depending on what's been going on in the community uh, as things change at NSF. For example, when um, reporting changes just happened fairly recently where you do your reports through something called uh, Grants.gov now, not Fastlane. So we had to update that in the handbook. And we try to keep abreast of changes within the community and make those changes in the handbook too. Um, for those of you who are brand new to ATE, or who kind of I noticed somebody was saying they just wanted a refresher, um, the ATE 101 section is really helpful. It just sort of goes over some basics about the program, a little bit of history, provides you with information about um, how to get in touch with your program officer, all kinds of things like that. There's good information there about um, outreach planning, and I'm going to talk a lot about outreach planning um, in my presentation. Uh, it's a really critical component for most of our uh, grants, and it's something that we always feel like we kind of can't get enough help with. You know, it's always great to hear what other folks are doing with outreach. Um, also, the the handbook covers who some of the other key AT players are, other folks you may want to get in touch with, um, like teaching technicians. Obviously, you're going to learn a lot about Evaluate today if you're, you're not already familiar with them. But there, there are a lot of other cross-cutting players in the community who can help support the work that you're doing. And there's a lot of good information in there about data management. And we've all now um, had to include um, information about data management in our grants. And all of you had to write a data management plan. And AT Central, as someone who I'm actually a librarian, or I was a more traditional librarian once upon a time, I'm now sort of a digital librarian, but as someone um, who comes out of that background, library and information science, I was thrilled to see NSF put in a mandate to have everyone do a data management plan because it really helps you think about a lot of issues. Um, the data management plan helps you with everything from evaluation to sustainability to archiving because it makes you think about how you're going to um, keep track of, manage, and preserve the data and deliverables created through your um, funding. And AT Central can certainly help you with that at a number of levels. We do create these digital records about each project and center and any affiliated resources that they have. And those records are available for you to use in any way you'd like. If you'd like to create your own resource collection, you are certainly welcome to harvest those records and other records from the portal back. Also, we, um, we are harvested, AT Central, by a number of other larger digital libraries, and so your records get pushed out to the larger education and digital library community. One of the things that I said we really focus on a lot at AT Central is outreach. And um, in the spirit of, of helping all of us do better outreach, um, we worked with WGBH Boston, in Boston, a large television, public television station, to create an, an online outreach kit. And this was created specifically for AT projects and centers. And it covers um, some of the basics of outreach, um, but also gets into how to best use social media, um, basics of communication both on, both on your campus and, and elsewhere, um, you know, how to do a press release, uh, how to do a, a press kit. Um, it, it outlines a, a lot of really useful outreach resources that you can find online. Um, and I would recommend that even if you're a small project, go up and take a scan through it. Obviously, there's a big difference in the kinds of outreach that a national center is going to do versus a small project. But it can be really helpful to think about all of the, the steps involved in creating a really robust outreach plan, even if you're smaller. Um, and one of the things that we tell folks to do right at the beginning of, of their project is really think about all the audiences that might want to hear about the work that you're doing. So identifying your audience early on, sitting down with your whole staff and just taking a little bit of time to think about 
who are your audiences? Who's your main audience? But who are all those other audiences that might be interested too? So maybe your your real focus. Um, for a big part of your grant is something as specific as second year female welding students. I adore this picture. I think these women look fabulous. Um, and um, But you want to think about the fact that while that might be your main audience, there may be a whole bunch of other audiences too that are interested in what you're doing. So a set of questions like this may be really helpful. Who are some of the folks on your own campus that would want to hear about what you're doing? Maybe some unexpected people, you know, not, not people just in your department but across the whole campus. Um, are there news outlets, local and national news outlets, that might be interested in, in what you're doing and the work that you're doing or work that one of your partners is doing? Are there professional associations that would be interested? You can sort of reverse it and think about the deliverables that you're creating and who could use and benefit those deliverables. And then another thing to not forget is that there, there's a whole bunch of folks within the AT community who are going to be very interested in what you're doing and it probably are engaging in some similar kinds of work. And one of the ways that you can find out a little bit more about the AT community and, and identify some of those potential project and center collaborators is through the AT Central map. So when you go up onto AT Central um, under the resources or under the projects and centers tabs, you'll get to this map that allows you to sort of slice and dice and zero in on um, projects and centers in different areas. So you can, uh, hopefully you can see that, that some of these little um, uh, colored dots, colored pins have a P on them and some of them have a C. And that differentiates between projects and centers. So there are all kinds of ways to slice and dice this map. What you can't see below it is that there's a list of different areas, topical areas, and that's the color coding. So that we divide ATE Central into a series of seven different areas, i.e. agro, manufacturing, you know, and, and those areas are reflected by the colors and the pins. And as you get down to the folks that you're interested in, you can actually hit a button and list all of the results. So that if, for example, you want to find mentors in the state where you are or in the region where you are and you don't care so much about their topic, you just like to find folks that are near to you physically, you can do that. But you can also look at everyone in nano or everyone in agro, both projects and centers and list that. So it's a nice way of sort of figuring out who the community is and getting in touch with some of your, your new colleagues. Another thing that many of us put into our outreach planning at one level or another these days is the use of social media and social media tools. And AT Central has a social media directory online that helps you track who's using what within the community. Um, you know, the obvious ones for most of us are things like Facebook and Twitter, but LinkedIn is used quite a bit too. Um, and uh, we go ahead and track all of the projects and centers. Um, the NSF projects, directorates, and offices, as well as some folks who are sort of we think of as ATE-related organizations like the American Association of Community Colleges. And this is a nice way to see who's using which tools, and it's a really easy way to start connecting with folks using social media. AT Central also does a monthly newsletter. It comes out the first Monday of each month called AT Central Connection. It's a great thing to subscribe to if you're new to the community. Um, and uh, it's also a great thing to start sending us your news and events to highlight um, in the newsletter. Um, you can go up onto the AT um, Central site and you can see the back issues of all of ATE Central Connections. So you can start to get a sense of what it's all about. We also um, maintain a very large events calendar for the community. And we certainly want to include any events that you have coming up on that calendar. Um, these are events that could be of interest to the community. They may be hosted by folks within ATE or they may just be things that are of interest to all of us like, for example, the American Association of Community Colleges annual conference would be, would be on the events calendar too. Um, I want to just point out to you briefly that we also created a little tool called a, uh, an events widget. And this allows you to stream events from our calendar onto your website. So if you're doing a small project in nanotechnology, and you, you're not really doing that many events yourself, but it would be sort of fun for you 
and your audience to be able to see things within the AT community related to Nano, you can go up, um, type in your preferences, and very easily, um, with a little snippet of code, stick that code right on whatever appropriate page it is on your website where you'd like the events to stream, and then they'll show up um, as new events are added in Nano. Those will show up on your calendar and your own site. Every quarter you'll get an AT Central Activity Report from us if you're the PI of your um, project or center. And this only goes to the PI unless the PI would like it to go to somebody else. So sometimes, once in a while, the PI would like it to go to the project manager. But generally this goes to, directly to the PI. And this just helps you understand what's going on on AT Central and within the community in terms of um, activity and, and resource and events. So you get four basic areas of information. You get information about your own project or center, i.e., who we have as the authorized contact, your website address, a description of your project or center, and any associated social media that you have. Then you get um, a project center activity. So we, we show you the resources that you have, how many times they've been accessed on our site, um, and the events that we've collected. Then we kind of jump up one area to that subject area activity. And um, as I mentioned before, we divide ATE into these seven or eight distinct areas. And so you'll get grouped with everyone who's in the same area as you, and we give you those sort of aggregate numbers, and then we go up one level still, and we give you the AT-wide activity. So these come out every quarter, as I mentioned, and you should get your first quarterly activity report this October. So even though it feels really early in the game to be talking about sustaining and archiving, it's always a good thing to think about early. So you just want to spend a little bit of time thinking about, particularly if, if you, well, whether or not you're, you feel like you're going to go back to NSF for more funding, and, and many of us do if it's our first project um, or, or a project uh, that we've been funded for. Even so, it's really important to think about what you might want to sustain long term. What, what is the cost of the deliverables that you have? You want to involve your partners, both in industry and at your own institution. And you want to think about all of the components within your project, the technologies, the activities, materials, the data, the staff, and think about how you will continue those on after the grant funding ends. And some of that may involve archiving. Um, AT Central does maintain an archiving service, and we're happy to talk to you about good ways to archive the materials that come out of your project long term. And finally, before I turn this back over to um, Kristen, I just wanted to, to let you know that if you got funded this year, you're, you're actually sort of part of a, a unique cohort of people that are being funded in the 20th year of the ATE program. So um, in conjunction with the community, AT Central is working on something called the ATE at 20 Book and Blog Project. And this highlights the 20th anniversary of ATE. Um, provides history and stories and all kinds of good uh, infographics and pictures from um, this, this two decades of advanced technological education. So um, the blog, which has been active since June, is up on the ATE Central site, and you're welcome to go up and read the blog posts. They come out every Monday. The book, which is about a 60-page book or booklet, will be um, going to the printers in the next few weeks, and we'll be ready for distribution at the PI meeting. So I'm going to turn this back over to Kristen now. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we do have a couple questions for you. First, wondering sure. if a new PI has not had much activity yet, what would they see on an activity report? Well, initially what's going to be great about getting the activity report for um, a new PI is that it gives them a chance to make sure that we have all their data correct. So they probably won't be, you know, they probably won't have any resources up there yet in terms of that sort of activity. Uh, there won't be a lot of folks clicking through and looking at their resources, but it's a great chance initially to make sure that we have a description of your project or center correct and that we have all the information, i.e., the PI and um, your institution and all of that sort of thing in place. 
The other thing that's going to be of interest because there are these sort of three levels is even though there may not be a ton of information about your own activity on AT Central, there will be in your own subject area. So you get to see what other folks have created. You get to see the top resources in Agro or Nano or whatever it is. And that's going to be nice to start acclimating yourself to the whole community. But that's a really big question. Great. Thank you. And um, if you do not get an activity, well, do the activity reports come automatically, Max wants to know, or do you need to sign up for them? We hope. <laughs> we hope they come to you automatically. We hope we get you in the, in the system. Um, you are always welcome to double check. You can send us an email and just say, I want to make sure that I'm in there and that I'm going to get an activity report this October. If you didn't get one this October, you will certainly get one in the next cycle. It's always tricky for us in the fall to make sure we've gotten everybody who's newly awarded in. Generally, they're in, and generally, they should get an activity report, but it's, it's always fine to double check with us on that. Great question. Thanks. Okay. And can AT Essential help PIs manage their data, as in a data management plan? Well, we certainly can help with some aspects of that. Um, it depends on, on what the person is asking for specifically, but we can certainly help advise you about things like metadata schema and how to archive and what, what might be ideal to archive. Um, so we're certainly happy to help you with some aspects of your data management plan. And when some people are writing their proposals, they call us and ask for a little bit of help in, in creating the plan initially. And we're always thrilled to be asked to help um, with um, managing uh, and, and sort of fulfilling the promises made in the data management plan. Great. And you didn't mention anything about costs, Arlen noticed. And so are there yeah. services that are free to AETE members? Are all of your services free? How does that work? Sure. Most of our services are free. Um, we occasionally help folks with um, building, a, for example, if a large center comes to us and says we want to develop a very large um, digital library of our own, sometimes some of the costs associated with cataloging or other things like that, that there is an extra cost and we do a sub contract or a subaward or a contract with them to do that. But for the most part, everything we do is, is free and is part of our um, – is wrapped into the cost of our grant. Great. We'll wrap up with one final question, Rachel. Um, if sure. you have a very small staff for a project or center, what are some easy ways to increase their outreach? Well, I think that's a great question. And I think it's, it's always a really um, – it's always really hard for all of us, no matter what size, we always feel like we don't have enough staff to do as much outreach as we'd like. Um, I think there's some great tips and tricks um, that we can share with you at AT Central about that. One thing, for example, is maybe working with a student um, who is a work-study student to, to, if you're interested in using social media, we've been very successful at using students at AT Central. They love using social media, and with just a little bit of training, they, um, they're thrilled to be able to help with that, and it's something they like doing a lot. Also, I would say it's really good to sort of get a sense of the lay of the land within ATE in terms of newsletters. There's lots of folks publishing newsletters and they're looking for good content. And sometimes that content can be repurposed for multiple newsletters across the community. We have a lot of other good ideas though on the site and we're always happy to talk with folks um, about other um, sort of low-hanging fruit vis-a-vis -vis outreach. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and we appreciate all your questions. You can type them in, remember, at any time. And even if something comes up um, that you would like to address to Rachel later, you can just note that, and we can try to address it. But now let's turn things over to Lori, who will discuss evaluation purposes and uses in ATE. Well, thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Rachel. Um, ATE Central, I just want to underscore, is really a wonderful resource to the ATE community. Um, Rachel and her team were really helpful to us when we were first starting out as a resource center to help us figure out how to set up and manage our digital resource collection. It was really invaluable advice. So I definitely encourage you to check out um, ATE Central if you haven't already. And much like the topics that Rachel touched on, like outreach and dissemination and sustainability, evaluation is a common element to all ATE grants. And like ATE Central, evaluate is a resource to support the ATE community. But of course, our focus is specifically on evaluation. So my intent for this part of the webinar is to make sure you get a really clear understanding of the role that evaluation is supposed to play in your ATE project. And what you should be doing with that information. 
provide that you collect or that your evaluator provides to you. And I say your evaluator because it is an expectation that all ATE projects and centers devote funds to contracting with an external evaluator. Although I understand that some smaller projects or planning grants may handle may actually handle it internally. But we're going to um, <clears throat> assume that most folks have an external person. So ideally, your evaluative activities and your use of that information is going to be well integrated into your project operations. But the role that evaluation actually plays in your grant is going to depend a lot on your attitudes toward it, believe it or not. If you haven't had much experience with evaluation, or maybe you haven't had such a great experience, you may think of it kind of just like this extra baggage just sitting there, comes along with the grant money, it's just something you have to do. Like this person who is just kind of annoyed that it's this thing, this evaluation piece is taking resources away from the main project work. But to get the most out of your evaluation and for, really, for it to add value to the project, which is what we want, I encourage you to think of it as a means of support to help you get where you need to go with your project. Like this person who is really looking to leverage evaluation as a means to improve the project work and make a case for continuation. So what are we really talking about when we throw around this term evaluation? I'm sure most of you are familiar with this story. It's a very old and often told a little story about a group of people who are blindfolded or blind inspecting an elephant. And they each have a limited perspective on this creature. And they come to very different conclusions about what it is because none of them are seeing it in its entirety. And I find this is a lot like evaluation. When I tell people where I work, which is the Western Michigan University Evaluation Center, they'll often say, oh, do you do surveys? Or, oh, you do the course evaluations? In this version of the cartoon, I've just thrown in some of the other common things that people equate with evaluation. And yes, it can be all of these things. But I really want to take a moment to zoom out and take a look at what evaluation is when we put all these bits together. Let's look at it in terms of the really big picture. First of all, we have our project. And here I've just depicted it in a generic logic model format, indicating that we're bringing some resources to the project in the form of inputs, time, money, expertise, personnel, equipment, and so forth. We're going to do something with our people and our resources. We're going to produce some tangible outputs. And then we're going to have some outcomes from the short term through the midterm to the long term. Next we have our evaluation questions. Now we don't want to confuse these with survey questions. These are overarching questions typically about the quality and impact of the project's activities and outcomes. For example, Kristen and I are working on an evaluation right now um, for a project that's aimed at increasing the representation of um, underrepresented groups in optical sciences. So a key question for that evaluation is to what extent is the project broadening participation and enhancing diversity in optical sciences research and the STEM workforce. So that's more than one data point. That takes a lot of different data points to answer that question, which brings us to our next component, which is data sources and the methods for getting that information. We need to collect data, various data for any evaluation that's going to help us answer those big questions. And these might come from different data sources. So we have several different data points and a few data sources. Next, we need to analyze, interpret, and synthesize the results to answer those evaluation questions. The data we collect don't speak for themselves, so there needs to be a process here for making meaning out of the results. Finally, we have reporting and use. The evaluation should generate some reports, so typically interim, annual, and final reports. And we should be using this information from the evaluation on the project side to determine ways to improve. Um, their evaluation may show us that we have a need to change our tactics in a significant way, in, in which case we might need to think about redirection of our resources. Um, at minimum, we need to produce annual reports for NSF for accountability purposes. And we'll also want to use the information for planning, either in terms of continuing the current work, sustaining the work, as Rachel referred to, or starting up a new initiative. So boiled down, Evaluation is really about asking questions, gathering data, 
answering those questions and using that information in, for various purposes. Now in our next webinar in November, we're going to go more deeply into each of these components and especially how to make clear connections between them. What you often see with people new to evaluation is that they go right to the data without clearly articulating a focus and the purpose of the evaluation or they quickly or not moving beyond the data uh, to support the conclusions and recommendations. So that's the whole evaluation elephant. So next we're going to look at the general purposes of evaluation a little more closely. Because if we want to be like that stick figure on the stairs who's using evaluation strategically, we need to think about just where those leverage points are so we can use our evaluation information to advance our work and it's not just a drain on resources or that extra baggage. But in this webinar we're going to focus really on the PI and the project staff side of things more than the specifics of evaluation design and data collection and things like that. Um, those are more in the evaluator's domain. But for evaluation to add value to your project, to your grant funded work, you really do need to have a solid understanding of where it fits in your project and, and the purposes it serves. And at this point I kind of want to draw your into your attention back to this first box to resources. Because we can set forth all the ideal situation of how evaluation should be conducted and used and so forth. But if there isn't enough invested up here into the inputs area, um, of course that's going to limit what you're going to be able to do. In general, there's a wide range of purposes for which evaluation um, is done. In the ATE context, evaluation typically serves three main purposes. And the first is to basically find out ways the project can be improved as it's being implemented. This is typically referred to as formative evaluation. The second is to reach conclusions, supported by evidence, of course, about the quality and impact of the project's achievements. This is usually called summative evaluation. And the most basic purpose is just accountability. And most of what you need to do for accountability purposes just requires good record keeping. But the information you need to track here is going to overlap substantially with what you need for other um, purposes related to your evaluation. But for accountability purposes, you basically need to demonstrate what you've done with the grant money. You know, did you deliver on what, uh, what you said you would do? And I want to stress here again that this, these are really just different purposes or uses of evaluation. They aren't necessarily different forms or types of evaluation or call for different kinds of data collection or analysis. And I'll say a bit more about these. Let's start with the improvement focus. So my former boss here at the WMU Evaluation Center, Daniel Stuffelbeam, who literally wrote the book on evaluation, he says that the most important purpose of evaluation is not to prove but to improve. And I love this quote because this is really the whole point of formative evaluation, to find out what's working well and what isn't so you can make those adjustments so you can improve your outcome. Both the evaluator and the project staff though need to have a commitment to using evaluation, conducting evaluation to make it happen, to, make, to bring this to fruition. For example, the project staff need to really make time for evaluation and this can be hard when you have deadlines piling up. Um, I, I, my advice is not to make it the last item item on your meeting agendas. It's typically the first thing that falls off when a PI gets busy with, with classes and other, other things, other work piling up. The staff also, everyone involved, needs to be open to hearing negative findings. This is, again, really the point of formative evaluation. Find out what isn't working well so you can make improvements. Gerhard Challenger, who was the co-lead for the ATE program for most of its long life, he recommends that those formative, that formative feedback be confidential between the evaluator and the project staff. And so it's, so that really everything is quite open and transparent and you can really see where those weak points are. And then you have to actually use the information uh, to adjust what you're doing if there is a need. On the evaluator side of things, the evaluator needs to take time to learn about the project and the context and the people involved to make sure it's relevant, to make sure the, the, the information is on track with what's, what's important and what the project is doing. He or she needs to be timely in the feedback so the information can be used for decision making. And the evaluator should be willing to spend the necessary time with you to help you understand the results and use them to guide your work. But again, this is also going to be relative to the resources put into the evaluation. While this evaluation for improvement purposes primarily has an internal audience, 
Summative evaluations are mainly for external audiences. Again, the purpose is to provide conclusions and supporting evidence about the quality and impact of the grant funded work. Basically, the issues are how well did you execute the project and what difference did it make? It's common for evaluation to be equated with determining whether goals were met. And that is important, but it's not always the same as impact. It really depends on the nature of the project goals and the way they were written. There are a variety of impacts that might be of interest in a given evaluation. These impacts might be things like changes in knowledge, skills, abilities, attitudes, performance, and so forth. They can manifest at different levels. And so it's, you want to think about where you want to focus the evaluation, at the individual level, the program, the institution, or organization, or even at the regional or national level. And timing is another consideration when it comes to impact. It's important to focus the evaluation resources on important impacts that are actually likely to occur before your grant expires. Sometimes it's unrealistic to expect that those long-term desired impacts can actually be measured during the life of the grant. But don't lose sight of those because you may be continuing this work over multiple grants. So you want to keep that, those long-term impacts on your radar. But regardless of where you focus the evaluation in terms of what types of impacts, you ultimately should be able to make some sound claims about the landscape of how the landscape of advanced technological education is going to be different or is different because of your contribution to the ATE program and be able to back up those claims with evidence. So let's return to accountability. Again, this is just simply as the word implies, accounting for what you did with the funding. In any project, it's really important to have good documentation about what you've accomplished. What did you do? Who did you reach? Who were your partners? What were your deliverables? This is basic information you'll need to report on in your annual reports to NSF, which we'll get to in just a moment. We have found it really helpful for our resource, resource center to maintain a VITA just like my you know, personal uh, curriculum VITA. This is not an evaluation report, but it's a great way to keep track of key activities and accomplishments. It's really useful at annual reporting time, and it's really useful for sharing with the public and with stakeholders to, to show what you've been up to. And you can visit our website there. I have the URL on the screen to, to, to look at this document and see what we've included in our project VITA. It will vary depending on the focus of your work. I've just listed the main components on the screen here. And keeping it up to date saves us a lot of time when it comes to reporting on our activities to our National Com Visiting Committee as well as our uh, reports to NSF. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that we have our goals listed front and center on our VITA. We're going to revisit the importance of goals and we'll review the NSF annual reporting requirements, which is just one of several places you'll need to report information from your evaluation. So just keep that in mind for now. It kind of brings us to what do we do with this information? As I mentioned before, I'm using these terms formative, summative, and accountability, but they're really just different uses of evaluation. There's quite a lot of overlap in the kinds of information that you need for each type of use and in the reporting. Regardless of, of why you collect information or from what sources and so forth, you'll want to reflect on that information regularly. So you can make, again, those changes to, to what you're doing if you need to. And if you re do receive formative reports um, from your evaluator, and those may not necessarily be real formal technical reports, but whatever form that's in, that information is for you to use internally and to share with stakeholders who need to know how the project is going. Your more summative results should be shared with key project stakeholders and your NSF program officer. And we'll get, how to, we'll get to how to do that in just a minute. These results are going to also be very important when you go to write a new proposal. And if you're an ATE center as opposed to a project, some of the findings regarding student and workforce impact will be needed for the ATE impact books. And I'll get to those as well. And finally, the annual survey of ATE grantees is another place where you'll be pulling information probably from your evaluation. Um, but it's going to be more straightforward accountability type information like the numbers of students or faculty served. So I'm going to look at each of these a little more closely now. So I'd just like folks to raise their hand. If you're a PI or a, a project staff person, do you know 
when your first annual report is due to NSF. So let's just have a show of hands. And while you do that, I'm going to get a drink of water. Good for you, Elaine. Elaine knows. We've got 11 hands raised, 11 out of 76. So not a lot of people have this on their radar yet. And it can kind of sneak up on you. It's important to, to figure it out and get it on that calendar now. Your uh, report must be submitted within 90 days before the end of the current budget period. So for example, if you received your award on August 1st, that means your first annual report is due around May 1st, so just about nine months into your work. Um, you may want to go back and check the recording of the webinar we did this past May in which Mike Lasecki, who is the gentleman you heard at the beginning of, before the start of the webinar um, from Maytag Networks, he gave some great advice to PIs on annual reporting. So the tabs um, in this graphic from research.gov, those identify the main components of the annual report that you must prepare for NSF. And you can go into research.gov at any time to acquaint yourself with the types of things you'll need to report on. And if you're used to the old Fastlane system, you'll want to note that there are some significant changes in the reporting categories. And I want to draw your attention at this point to the accomplishments section. And this is where, remember I highlighted the goals part of our VITA, this is where you'll have to clearly identify your goals and your progress towards meeting them. Um, if you're just starting out on a new grant, this is a really a perfect time to revisit those goals you put in your proposal to make sure they're still accurate and realistic and that you'll actually be able to talk about them and your progress towards meeting them in concrete ways when it comes time to do that annual report, which is going to come up real fast. In this section of the report, you also need to um, describe your activities, objectives, results, and or outcomes. You need to report on at least one of these. And this is also where you will upload your evaluation report. That's how you get your report to your NSF program officer. We at Evaluate have developed a resource to help you with annual reporting. It's simply a Word document that lists all the report sections and subsections. Now you can find a template um, for an annual report on the research.gov site, but what our document has that that one does not is NSF's descriptions of what goes in each category, which I find extremely helpful to have right in front of my face as I'm writing my annual report. So there's a link to this resource on our handout that Kristen mentioned and that's on our website. Or you can just search our re resource library on this on the keyword research.gov. Completion of an annual survey that Evaluate conducts is an expectation of all ATEPIs as well. We've been running the survey out of WMU since 2000, and we consistently get a response rate of above 90%, and that's just wonderful. Uh, you can preview the survey on our website. Actually, we have the 2013 version on there now. The 2014 version will be up probably within the week. It, it won't be. Uh, re it really is the same survey, just updated with different dates. Um, and we'll have hard copies available at the PI conference. And example items are things like the number of students and their demographic characteristics, the number of professional development participants, numbers of materials produced. The survey opens each year in mid-February and stays open for about a month. And there's a, it's, it's long, but you only have to answer the questions that are relevant to the type of project you're doing. Okay, proposals. You just got your funding and we're already having you think about your next proposal. But like Rachel said about sustainability, it's never too early to start thinking about your next proposal. And when you go to do that, if the PI or the co-PI on that proposal has received prior NSF funding, you have to start that project narrative with a section called results from prior NSF support. And here reviewers are going to be looking for uh, descriptions of your outcomes and results and evidence of the quality and effectiveness of your prior work. And guess what? That means your evaluation results. I mentioned the ATE uh, impact book. If you're an ATE center as opposed to a project, you'll be asked to contribute to the ATE impact book and website developed by our friends at Maytech. And they specifically ask for hard data on student and workforce impact. So if you already have this information as part of your evaluation, then it's going to be really easy for you to provide them with the items they need for this great source of information about the ATE program. 
So I've thrown a lot at, at you. It may seem kind of abstract. It may seem overwhelming. So I thought I would just walk you through a real world example of how we at Evaluate conduct and use evaluation. And I'm just I'm going to use this webinar as an example. We do lots of things, but I'm just going to focus on this webinar. And actually, our evaluation starts before this webinar even happens. When we begin preparing for this webinar, our team sat together and viewed the recording of the webinar that we did last year on the same topic. So we looked at the results. Um, we looked at that and we looked at the results of the, of the evaluation survey that the participants completed at the end of the webinar. And we took that information into consideration as we revised the webinar content and structure for this year. And now we are in the present moment in the midst of this new and improved webinar. And as soon as this webinar ends, our team is going to meet up and debrief on how we think things went and, and we'll make notes about what we want to do differently, either for our very next webinar in November or the one we do on the same topic next year. And at the end of this webinar, you're going to be asked to complete a very short feedback survey, which we hope all of you will do. And we're going to use that information to inform our ongoing work. But it doesn't end there. Annually, our external evaluator, Lana Rux, gathers data from Evaluate's entire audience, not just webinar participants, about their perceptions and of the overall quality and utility of our webinars and all of our other resources, as well as the extent to which they use those resources and how our work has impacted their evaluation practice and project work. And we'll share her report with our NSF program officer and our national visiting committee along with the combined results from our internal evaluation work. So you can see this is really a mix of informal and formal reporting and use of evaluation. And it's also an uh, integration of internal and external evaluation, which I show here. We have the internal evaluative activities um, outlined in blue and the external evaluation highlighted in orange. So we're coming up to the PI conference. And a couple of years ago at the Getting Started workshop at the ATE PI conference, someone asked us what they should expect to receive from their external evaluator. And this is a pretty fundamental question. So I hope no one leaves this webinar without clarity on this issue. In a typical ATE evaluation, the external evaluator should provide you with a detailed evaluation plan, opportunities to review and provide feedback on things like instruments and processes and reports and so forth before they're finalized, interim and annual reports, and most importantly, knowledge and insights that you couldn't have obtained on your own or else. What is the point of hiring an expert external consultant? So you were required to have an evaluation section in your proposal. So why, why do you need to have a detailed evaluation plan now? What's that all about? Well, it's because in your proposal, you probably only had about two pages to describe the evaluation, which just isn't enough space to make it actionable and to really serve as a guide for implementing the evaluation. In a more detailed plan, you want to see a clear statement of purpose for the evaluation and the big questions it's going to address, what methods and data sources will be used for the evaluation, how the data will be analyzed, what deliverables will be generated, and in what time frame, and importantly, a delineation of responsibilities because often an external evaluator has to rely on the grant staff for access to data or to participants. Um, so you really need to be clear up front about who is responsible for what to make sure the, um, the expectations of the evaluation are met. So backing up just a little bit, um, note that a key deliverable for, for the evaluation is, is a report or multiple reports. And a question we used to get a lot is, what do I do with my evaluation report? I think there's more clarity on this issue now that we've moved from Fastlane to research.gov for reporting, but I just want to review um, the basics. Unless you've made some other kind of contracting arrangement, your evaluator works for you as the PI, the ATE grantee. So his or her report should go to you as the PI. We strongly advocate sharing this report with other project stakeholders, like partners and advisors and participants. Um, even having meetings that focus on evaluation where the evaluator is there to discuss the results. But really that dissemination occurs at the discretion of the PI. As I've mentioned, the report should 
also must also go to the program officer, um, which you submit again as part of your annual reporting through research.gov. And there are, just note there are limits to how much you can actually upload as attachments through, through research.gov. So you want to check on those limitations if you have some kind of a massive evaluation report. So just summing up, um, I want to just keep in mind that the time you invest up front in planning and clarifying evaluation needs ex ex and expectations is going to pay off in dividends later. And we're going to pause for a question break right now, but in the next section, Elaine Kraft is going to come back and she's going to give you a lot more guidance on how to set up those expectations and communicate those expectations with your evaluator as well as other stakeholders who have uh, an important role in the evaluation and providing data for the evaluation. So I'll turn it over to Kristen now for your questions. Thank you, Lori. Um, we do have a question. There's a person that's trying to set up a statement of work with their evaluator right now, and they're struggling to get all of the things that you mentioned about evaluation into the scope. Are there any examples of evaluation scopes of work? Or well, that is a great question. It's a question that I'm hearing more and more. So I think we actually need to do that. I'm sorry to say we don't have it. Um, I am happy to say that Michael Secchi at Maytech is working with us in, on developing materials uh, and models to share with the community. So I think Mike is probably taking notes that that's something we need to work on together to get out to the to the um, to the ATE community. But trying to hit on those things, you're not going to be able to figure out every single detail fully, you know, over what's going to happen over the course of a year or two years. But try to um, think ahead to what needs to happen in, in a timely way, and make you can't over communicate in, in expectations and needs at, at this point when you're setting things up with an evaluator. You really need to to take the time for them to get to know uh, what what your priorities are, what your project is about. And Elaine is going to talk more about that, so I won't say any more because I don't have the answer that she's looking for. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from Chris. Is an independent evaluator mandated by all ATE grants, or only when the scope of the project indicates that the PI and project manager cannot manage the evaluation? The last time I looked at the ATE solicitation, and I don't think it's unless there's a brand new one out, it, sa it states that there must be a line in the budget for external evaluation. Now I think the exceptions are if you have a very small grant or if you have um, if it's a planning grant. There are some cases when, and there's different kinds of external evaluation, right? You could have somebody completely external to your institution, or you could have someone external to your unit. So maybe you're really relying on your institutional research office, and I think that's probably acceptable. You might want to check with a program officer um, to make sure that's sufficiently independent. But for a larger scope project, for most projects, you're going to need, and NSF will expect, an external person in that role. Okay. We have another good question. When should the detailed evaluation plan beyond two pages be completed before proposal submission? Well, the detailed plan would happen after you get your funding. So you're going to have an you would have had a, a an overview in your proposal, which could be have been maybe as short as half a page, although I doubt it, and as long as three pages. That's Demonstrating that you're taking evaluation seriously, it's showing what you would focus on. That you're demonstrating that evaluation is going to be integrated into your into your operations, um, and naming who you're going who's going to do the evaluation. Once you get your funding, that's when you get that contract set up with your evaluator and you work with them to develop that more detailed plan that's really actionable. So that would happen after the funding is received. Lori, we've gotten questions in the past about the overlap between the annual NSF reports and the annual ATE survey and whether they should be aligned somehow. Could you comment further on that? Sure. Lip, everyone wants to do one thing instead of two, and I can understand that. The annual reporting system for NSF is set up for all of NSF. In fact, I, I could be wrong, but I think research.gov is actually for even more than NSF, but it's set up for just a huge array of types of projects, whether you're researching climate change or you're overhauling a community college technician certification program. So, you know, there's some basic things that everyone funded by NSF has to report on. The difference with the ATE survey is really tailored to the ATE program. 
and another key reason that it can't that the one what do you want to say you can't kill two birds with one stone here is because um, the the annual reporting system creates PDFs about a single project and it's really not a feasible way to pull out the data points from those PDFs and roll it up into a database about the entire ATE program. So it's simply not feasible. The good news is there's a lot of overlap. So you can collect the same information and just have it ready to report in two different places. In fact, uh, in January, our webinar is going to focus on this very issue, all the different kinds of information you need for the different reporting venues and how to streamline data collection and reporting. Well, thank you all for your questions. And now let's move into the final section of the webinar with Elaine, who will focus on communicating evaluation needs and expectations. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Lori, that was a lot of wonderful information. And I'd like to add just a couple of comments to what you've said. First, it is important to remember that NSF has a major focus on uh, research. This means that while glowing reports of how well things are going with your project are appreciated, your program officer will be equally interested in what didn't work so well. What has been learned through your work that contributes to our collective knowledge of what works and what doesn't in technician education? Also, as a PI, you will need to keep in mind that although you may be contracting for external evaluation work to be done for your project, or assigning this work to someone internal to your organization, the ultimate responsibility for evaluation falls to you, the PI. It is up to you to make sure that you're getting the data, documentation, and help you need to make your case. As Lori mentioned, convincing data and well-documented outcomes will be needed for many reasons, not the least of which is to position yourself and your organization to receive additional funding. This has become so important that the results of prior support is now the first thing that you're expected to include in a project description for an NSF ATE proposal. So your award letter arrives. Now what? As I'm sure you've discovered, it is a long process from proposal conception to proposal submission to receipt of an award to actually launching your project. For this process to take 18 months or more is not uncommon, but wow, when that award letter arrives, isn't it exciting? It is such a highly anticipated and exciting event, you would think that the award would be hand delivered and arrived by armored truck, perhaps with a marching band. In reality, NSF ATE awards arrive as an unheralded, unheralded email, typically to the president or sponsored research officer of your institution. It will be up to you to make sure that the receipt of your NSF ATE award is a big deal and that it gets some publicity for both you, your college, and your partners. Then what? You need to make sure that your evaluators and others are on board for the scope of work with, for which you have been funded and that commitments made many months ago will still be honored. Make sure that everyone is clear on the start date of the project this is a very important date, and this date sets the clock ticking for deadlines that NSF sets for your project, and I'll mention a little bit more about that later. Once your support team is alerted, you can then shout it from the rooftops. The next thing, you need to get to work, but not on your project quite yet. First things first, address essential administrative duties as soon as possible. For example, it is important to process all contracts and agreements associated with your project so that others may begin work too. This includes your contracts or subawards with your evaluator, partnering institutions, and perhaps others you included in your budget. Work with your purchasing department and business office to get this task accomplished. They are accustomed to doing this and you may not be. If you've got faculty members who need release time or if your project requires that you hire staff, you'll need to work with your personnel office to make sure you get this process started correctly for your institution. And don't forget to talk with impacted department heads or division chairs who may need to accommodate faculty schedule and hire adjunct faculty to make release time possible. Now, let's talk a little more specifically about establishing expectations with your evaluator. You need to work with your evaluator to determine the data and other evidence of project impacts that will be needed. 
Then consider where you will get that data. What are your sources? Most projects require data from the PI's institution. And the question is, are you going to need data from partner institutions as well? The answer is usually yes if you have partnering institutions, and this requires extra effort and ongoing effort on your part. You also need to revisit the Institutional Review Board or IRB determination for your project. Are there any IRB considerations of which your evaluator needs to be aware? What are the specifications in the data management plan that was included with your proposal? Rachel mentioned that document uh, early in the webinar. Perhaps someone else wrote this plan for you. Well, now it's time to read it. Your evaluator and you need to understand how data will be gathered, managed, protected, and shared. And what evaluation activities are planned for the project? If you worked with your evaluator during the preparation of your proposal, and the proposal contained a detailed plan, then you still need to revisit the plan and activities that were proposed. You may need a more detailed plan, as Lori mentioned, or some changes may need to be made before you get started, uh, particularly um, if your budget for your project, if your project was not funded at the level that you requested, then the scope of work has probably changed. And so the evaluation plan that you were thinking about is going to need to change as well. So what data, documentation, or evidence will be needed to answer the questions and to establish the degree to which you are achieving your stated goals and objectives, not only at the end of your project timeline, but also at milestones during the project? Until you know some of these things, you can't be certain of your data needs. Consider how often your evaluator will need to make site visits or be engaged in your project activities. How and how frequently will you communicate with your evaluator? There are, are there project advisory groups for your, um, that are planned to have meetings and your evaluator should attend? Um, your evaluator may need to be on site for any number of reasons. That becomes a cost consideration with travel, so make sure that you talk with your evaluator up front about the times that it will be essential for that person to be on site. It's also vitally important to determine who will be responsible for collecting data and information and when. Uh, Lori also mentioned that in, in her section. Uh, it is typically a shared responsibility, so it is important to have a clear understanding of who is responsible for what and how data and information will actually flow to the evaluator. In addition to developing your project activity timeline in greater detail, consider your evaluation timeline as well. Uh, evaluators are typically working on multiple projects simultaneously, and it's important to have your needs established and your dates on the evaluator's calendar. Also, if your evaluator is not involved in an institution, um, or an academic institution, he or she may not understand the calendar of your institution and when faculty may be available and not available, students available and not available. Uh, and so it's just really important to, to do that calendaring together. Once you and your evaluator are in agreement about the evaluation plan and timeline, as well as the evaluation activities and data needs, then you need to communicate this with the entire project team and your partners who will be involved because you and your evaluator will need their help throughout the project. I've emphasized the importance of having an evaluation timeline. Among the important dates to include in the calendar is the reporting dates for your project. And Lori asked a question about whether you even know when your first report is due. Your evaluator uh, can and should support your data and reporting needs. So knowing when your annual report will be due to NSF, when your advisory group or groups are scheduled to meet, and when the annual ATE survey will need to be completed will enable you to set deadlines for your evaluator in advance of these key dates on your calendar. As your evaluator supplies findings from the evaluation work being completed, you will have information that can be shared not only with the NSF but also with advisors, partners, collaborators, in project newsletters, on a website, and in many other ways. Evaluation feedback can help guide adjustments in your work to achieve better outcomes, and importantly, it can help you tell your story 
and celebrate your success. Sometimes surprises are a good thing. But when it comes to what you need from your partners, however, surprises are never appreciated. Make sure from the beginning that your data plan and expectations are very clear with everyone. Specify or clarify definitions, especially as they pertain to data requests. Be crystal clear and firm about timelines and deadlines. If there is one challenge that seems to be common across multi-partner projects, it is the challenge of getting data from all partners as requested and on time. The more safeguards you put in place at the start of the project, the more likely you will be to overcome this challenge in a positive way. Uh, I'd like to uh, direct your attention to uh, the webinar handout. Uh, there is a link on the handout to a PI to-do list that you may find very helpful in determining when certain things need to get done. In working with your evaluator and your partners, you need to confirm or set metrics for success. You should start, you should use target numbers and not just percentages, as that can be misleading depending on your sample size. It is wise to set interim benchmarks for your work that lead to overall end of project goal metrics. You don't want to wait till the month before the end of the project to find out that you're way behind on meeting a certain goal. Time flies when you are busy with all the activities of your project. So gauging your progress against interim metrics will help alert you when adjustments need to be made. They can also provide success points for celebration when things are going well. One additional point, when you are engaged in a multiple partner project, you should be using uniform data capture strategies and evaluation tools, such as surveys, across the partnership. If you don't, then your evaluator will end up with numbers that can't be added together to show the overall impact of your efforts. Be diligent about capturing activity dates, location, and participant information, including demographics. Your evaluator is not likely to be able to attend all project functions, so get in the habit of thinking about and collecting data every time you conduct or participate in an event, offer a service, or launch a website. To recap regarding the importance of developing an evaluation plan and schedule, you should schedule your evaluation activities with your evaluator well in advance. The discipline of advanced scheduling will help you with project management, and it will help ensure that evaluation activities are well aligned with the project and that your evaluators provide data analysis and other findings when you need them. However, in spite of the best scheduling efforts, change is inevitable. So make sure that you alert your evaluator as soon as possible when there is a change in the project schedule so that evaluation activities can be adjusted as well. Now to recap regarding reports you need from your evaluator. You should be specific about your needs and expectations, set and communicate dates, send reminders if needed to make sure that you have what you need when you need it, be proactive. In advance of a reporting deadline for your evaluator, ask if the evaluator needs anything additional from you to complete his or her report. Determine the time frame for annual reporting. I recommend setting an annual cutoff date for data collection and sticking to it. Anything that happens after the cutoff date can be reported in the following year. This is essential to do or you will find yourself absolutely going crazy, editing reports time and time again as new data is received or another activity is completed. Set the annual cutoff far enough, enough in advance of your reporting deadline to allow for collecting and collating information, drafting and proofreading your report and that of your evaluator. Use a calendar year-end as your cutoff um, if you can, because this will align your data collection with the requirements of the annual ATE survey. We did this a few years ago for our projects and it's really worked well. Your first annual report to NSF is going to cover less than a year's work. As Lloyd pointed out, it's due actually three months before the first year anniversary. So um, setting your uh, data cutoff date even earlier than that is, is a problem, um, is you know, going to work okay. And NSF program officers understand um, that in the first year of the project, they're not going to be getting a full year of uh, activities and findings and outcomes from you. 
And remember, no report, no additional grant funds if you have a continuing award. So this is an important deadline to meet. Now, back to the project start date. I'd like for you to go to the little icons on the left and raise your hand if you know when your project start date is. Oh my, we have a lot of people out there who don't know when their project starts. The place to look for that date is actually on your proposal. Believe it or not, you've probably done this to yourself. Um, in almost every case, the start date is the date you requested when submitting your proposal. That date sets the clock ticking at NSF and is very important to the timing of your project work and reporting. On the screen you see the start date for the Mentor Connect project. I would also like to recap my advice on setting expectations and being firm. It is important to remember that the Principal Investigator, or PI, is ultimately responsible for project outcomes. As the NSF designated leader of the project, you need to be clear and you need to be firm. Your future success depends on demonstrated outcomes and impact. For this reason, I encourage you to build data reporting and accountability into your contracts and agreements with partners. Make on-time data reporting a contractual obligation. Then adhere to the golden rule, the one who has the gold rules. The NSF has entrusted you and your college with the money. To the degree possible, arrange things so that you do not have to release money to others if they are not fulfilling their obligations and contributing to your success. You will recall that I suggested that a, as a first step that you reaffirm the commitment of those who say they would support your project when the proposal was drafted. Sometimes those commitments can't be honored or simply are not honored when you actually do the work of the project. Keep in mind, divorce is not out of the question. If partners or personnel are not working out, you need to make a change before irreparable damage is done to your project. NSF expects you to be learning from your work and making adjustments as necessary to maximize project outcomes. Remember, NSF expects you to behave like a researcher. When what you are doing isn't working, try something new. Don't ignore problems. Work with your project team, program officer, and your college administration to address them head on and then move on. If in doubt, do check with your program officer. They will not think badly of you for doing so. While NSF is interested in your success, what you are learning about what works and what doesn't in technician education is equally of interest. Now let's talk in more specifics about data. The data you need on students resides in college databases. Faculty members have some access to institutional student data, but probably not enough access to meet your NSF ATE project needs. So you will need to find and make friends with the data person on your campus. You need a, a person who both knows the student database very well and has the ability to generate the reports you need. Such data people are usually found in an institutional research, institutional effectiveness, or similar office. Once you determine who you need to speak with about your data needs, you need to do your homework and prepare for that conversation. Now, I'm going to take a minute and ask you another question. Do you know who the data person is on your campus? If so, raise your hand. Click on the, high, the hand icon if you know who your data person is at your institution. Okay, well, you're going to need to learn some Data Speak 101 skills to talk to your data person. If your experience includes creating and using databases, you may be already quite fluent in Data Speak. If not, there are a few things you will need to learn. All data is stored in data fields, not unlike common uh, columns on a spreadsheet. Every field has a name and holds an entry. 
that is a very specific uh, piece of well-defined data. So looking for data in a database is a matter of matching. So your data person will need very specific criteria for generating a query to obtain the desired information you need. He or she must uh, use specifics that precisely match data fields that are available. The more specific the request, the better. When you present your request, the data person may ask you lots of questions. Um, and the more preparation you have for that conversation, uh, the more easily you'll be able to answer those questions. You may need to know the names and numbers of courses in which ATE innovations are being introduced. You may need to know the terms the course will be offered, when it was offered in the past for, data, for baseline data, when it's going to be offered in the future. You probably need to know section numbers. Uh, you may need special information if they're online courses. Um, so there are just many, many questions like that that you will need to think through before you talk to your data person and be as specific as you can about um, questions like annual. If you want annual data, what does annual mean? Uh, do you want your data person to collect fall, spring, summer data? Or do you want them to do summer, fall, spring data? Or perhaps just the academic year, which would be fall and spring. You need to, to tell your data person all of those specifics. The categories you need may or may not match with what's captured in the database of the college. So you may need to adapt to the data that is available. I think you get the point. If you can figure all this out, or at least most of the details, before talking with your data person, you will get a gold star for data speak. And the data person will be very appreciative and will not ask you nearly as many questions. Another point I would like to make about talking with your data person is to be respectful of other demands on his or her time. Last minute requests are not appreciated and they may be denied. Plan ahead and give your data person as much time as possible to fulfill your data request. If you have set up your data collection cutoff and reporting timelines, then you will have a good idea of when you will absolutely need the data you are requesting. This will enable you to make a reasonable request and set a valid deadline for your request to be processed. So spend some time on this and think about it. And talk to your evaluator about it, who is likely to be very fluent in data speak. Another thing to be, that is helpful to understand about getting data from your institution is that data collection and reporting has traditionally been a, to be for the purpose of meeting federal and state mandates. Thus, the database and routine reports that are generated are designed for specific target audiences. Those audiences have different needs than those of you in your project. You may be able to get some useful data from existing reports, but it's more likely that you will need to request special reports be generated that meet you and your evaluator's needs. Also, within the college database are optional and required fields. Some data isn't required of students and thus is inconsistently captured and of little use for research and evaluation. An example is veteran status which may or may not be requested, and if requested, will be optional for reporting. So beware that there may be data fields in the database that sound promising, but in reality are not very helpful. One case in point is IPEDS data. This data designation and reporting is common to all colleges. It is super easy for your data person to provide IPEDS data. But the definitions don't usually match up well for ATE projects. For IPEDS, only first time, full-time freshmen are captured in cohorts and followed over time. ATE projects, as you probably know, very often deal with returning students and more with students that do not attend full-time. There are other issues of data integrity that we will not have time to explore today. You just need to know that IPEDS data probably won't meet your needs and you need to question anything that doesn't look right when you do receive your data reports. Um, sometimes males and females are designated wrong um, and that sort of thing. Uh, most data is, is, you know, entered by humans and there's a lot, you know, can be human error in that. So always be questioning. Baseline data are important for most evaluations. If you don't know where you start, you don't really know where you're going. So. Um, 
if you have stated those baseline data in your proposal and your goal is to impact these numbers through your project innovations, if you have not yet established baseline data, you will need to determine the specifics for that data and be consistent with future data capture so that you'll be able to compare apples to apples. You will need to define your cohort for study and the data elements that need to be captured for the cohort. Your evaluator can be very helpful in making this determination. Once you have this definition, you can begin to drill down to the specifics of data that you will want to capture about those students or participants. Having common definitions across partnerships is very important, as I mentioned earlier. If your project involves students at different institutions or perhaps high school and college students, the data you receive from each participating entity needs to be as consistent as possible. What is captured, when it is captured, and how it is captured. Providing clear definitions is a good way to help ensure that the data you collect will be useful. Data definitions you prepare for your data person can help partners request the same data from the data person at their institution. Time frames are very important. For example, enrollment in a given term is snapshot data. Is that snapshot to be taken the first day of the term or perhaps after the drop ad period? Whatever time you select should be used uniformly from term to term and by all partners. Will there be cohort comparisons? If so, you will be comparing prior classes to current classes, or perhaps will you be comparing across different sections of the same course taught in the same term? These decisions need to be made at the start of the project and evaluation. Also, be careful when implementing new or improved programs that your program and enrollment growth isn't at the expense of other programs at the college in the same department or division. You don't make friends that way. When something is perceived to be more exciting is introduced, it's possible to see shifts of students internally hurting one program while benefiting another. When the goal was to attract new students to the college and to increase overall enrollments in engineering technology or some other field of study. The goal should be net gain for all, with students being attracted to advanced technologies. Thank you, Elaine. We're actually getting to the very end of the webinar. We only have two or three minutes left. So we want to quickly just get everyone um, to our survey and to some of our, um, of our coming events. So if you could just uh, be sure to try to meet us at the or, I'm sorry, come to our next evaluation webinar, which is on November 20th. Um, it's going to be on connecting the dots for an effective evaluation. We are also hopefully hopeful that you will be able to make it to the ATEPI conference, and that is on October 23rd. We will be um, in Washington, D.C., and we look forward to seeing you there. You will be able to visit, I'm sorry, you will be able to see um, Mentor Connect, ATE Central, and Evaluate. We'll have showcase sessions at all of the, um, or I'm sorry, at the at the conference. Please visit our website at ATE. I'm sorry. Please visit our website at Evaluate.org, where you can learn more about these events and search our research library. You'll be able to see past webinars and see a recording of this webinar. And we're hoping that you will please complete our webinar survey. It's going to come up for you right now. It may be no surprise that evaluation is really important to us here at Evaluate. So we'd really like to have your feedback on this webinar as well as your ideas about topics that you would like us to address in future webinars. The survey should now be up on your screen and it will take you just a minute or two to, com to complete it. We're going to leave the survey open. Moderators, please do not close the survey window on your screen. And while you're working on that, we'd like to thank you for your participation in today's webinar. Elaine, Rachel, Lori, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. And to all of you, good luck with your proposals and have a really great day.